Sorry for the delay there. I had to reboot the laptop. It was being obnoxious. Okay, some announcements before we start. Ah, today is the last actual day of content. Really, we're sort of wrapping up the course today. Next week is review and exams discussion and stuff. You don't have to come. I will record it as always. So if you want to take the day off, you are welcome to do so. And the recording will be up on YouTube. And you can watch it there. So your call. It's your day. It's your adults. You can figure that out. Uh, the exam is now done for Section A. Section B is still writing tomorrow. Please do not talk about it yet. You know, obviously, you can sort of complain about your grades, but don't talk about the actual exam until the last group finishes writing their exam. The grades are posted on Blackboard almost for the whole group here. Uh, there's a few people who haven't because I don't have your exams yet for a variety of reasons, and once I get them, I will mark them. We're starting the marking of Section B now. You folks wrote on Thursday. They didn't start until Friday afternoon, so there's a lag there, and so we got yours done first, and then we'll start on the other section. Um, and I have posted a brief thing on Slack, uh, just sort of talking about, and I put it on Blackboard too, talking about the distribution of the grades. It's a really skewed distribution, really skewed. 70% of the course got an A, 30% of the course did not, and of those 30%, there were quite a few zeros, which is the unfortunate downside to the way this exam worked, is that if you don't hand anything in, I can't mark anything, and if you hand something in that has no content, I can't mark it either. So you will receive back your sheet that you handed in with your name and your student number at the top with your rubric marked by hand and your workshops if you show up. In addition, this week in workshop, you will be writing the statistical comprehension test again, the one from the start of the semester. Completion of this second one gets you a bonus quiz, which counts toward your final grade. Yes? That's irrelevant. Your, your grade doesn't matter. This is, this is for yourself to see how far you've come, and it's for me to evaluate the aggregate course. It's not about an individual student. It's not about you having gone from zero to 100. It's about whether the course as a whole has gone from an average in the 30s to like 60s and 70s. And you won't know everything yet. There's stuff on this comprehension test, which is second semester. We're going to do this again next semester. By the end of this year, if you're sticking with this course, if you're taking 1052, you should know everything on that test and be able to do really well. And that's kind of the goal, is for you to be able to see how far you've come and for us to measure how much you've learned and compare that to sort of other curriculum and things like that. It's research about what works for teaching. But, you know, we get to do stats research about stats in stats teaching. It's sort of circular, but it is actually quite interesting because without measuring things, you really are just going off your gut and if I've taught you one thing this semester, it should be that your gut is shit. You cannot trust your gut. And so we need measurements, we need data, we need numbers, so that next year when I go to do this course again, we'll look back and be like, okay, so what worked? What didn't work? What did we change? And there's things about this course, the way we ran it this year, that we're not happy with. And I'm sure you're not either, and you have your course evaluations to tell me what those things are. There are aspects of this course that I think worked really well. And I'm going to try and keep those pieces and keep iterating until we get a better course. So any questions? Any concerns? Uh, once you have your sheets back from workshop, you can bring them and talk to me if you are at all concerned. Um, you should know what you uploaded, though. I mean, it's your computer. You still have it. And you should be able to sort of go through it and see. Once the final section has written uh, tomorrow, I will be posting a set of solutions for the different variations of the exams. And so you can see what a perfect exam would look like versus what you did and hopefully be able to see why you lost a mark here, a mark there, and so on. And like I said, something like 170 out of the 270 people in this class actually got an 80 or above, which is great. And I'm really, really happy. And I, I was ecstatic to see so many good grades. This isn't a usual distribution of an exam where it's centered in the 70s and there's you know half the class is below the 70. The median grade was an 84. That means half the class got an 84 or above. And I told you ahead of time, I was OK with that. You just had to study, and you had to take advantage of the fact that we gave you a dry run, and we told you what was going to be on the exam to actually prepare. And for those who didn't, I'm sorry. But you know, it was a 15% exam. It wasn't something you could just wing the night before. You had to actually put some time in. OK, let's do the last lecture of the course. So last week, we talked about our second lecture on chi-squared. Two weeks ago, we did goodness of fit. Last week, we did goodness of fit. 
expanded, which is this test for two-way contingency tables and test for independence and homogeneity. Today, I want to try and build your intuition about this because it's absolutely going to be on the exam. So let's try and understand what's going on with these tables and how the chi-squared test kind of thinks about these p-values. And we're going to do that, as we have all semester, by doing some simulations. This is also just another opportunity, I'm hoping, for all of you to see some more R code and go, you know what, I kind of understand what you're doing there. Which means success again. The workshops have taught you something. And I don't know what that something is, but you've learned something about being able to use R. And next semester, if you stick with the course, we're just going to keep building. We're going to learn to do regression and all these other things in R, which if you have any upper year friends, they can tell you it does come up again. It's not like this is a completely useless thing that I'm teaching you that you will never touch again in your life. Especially if you stick with science, if you want to go to grad school, you will use this again. And if you have a career, lots of you are in the sciences, biological sciences, environmental sciences, and you will work with your degree doing something and having access to this tool is a valuable thing. So we're talking about tests for goodness of fit and the two tests for last week, which were the two-way tables, and we're going to do some simulations based on those. So uh, the hypothesis for a chi-squared goodness of fit is the null hypothesis is that the observed counts follow the same distribution set of PIs as the expecteds, and the alternative is that there is an inconsistency between these. This is two weeks ago, remember. It's Benford's Law and things like that. It's, it's a single row of numbers or a row of numbers and then another baseline row of numbers. And when we're doing the test of independence, it's that the grade and the goal are independent, and goals do not vary by grade. Now, I ripped this from last week's slide. This is just the two variables, and that obviously changes based on what example you're doing. This is actually the, uh, remember the primary school students? It's whether the grade that they are in and their goals in life, you know, as little proto-humans being 10 years old or whatever, uh, whether those are independent or not. And the test statistic, as we talked about last week, and hopefully this last uh, assignment, which you just finished up, has sort of reinforced to you, it's the same formula that we used for goodness of fit, just expanded where you have to do it for every cell. So you work across the rows as well as down the columns, not just one of the two. So that's the context of what we're talking about. I'm just going to jump over uh, the other notes. We'll come back to this maybe. So let's talk about... An example which hopefully I think everybody here has played the game rock, paper, scissors. So if I come up to you and I'm like, ready? One, two, three. And rock beats scissors. So you've all played that game. It's kind of a stupid game, but you've all played it and it's a really easy game to talk about. So let's use it as our example today. So uh, it's what's known as a non-transitive game because everything you choose has the potential to win with the same probability as the potential to lose. It's not as if rock, you know, it goes this way around, rock beats scissors, which beats paper, which beats rock. But the thing is, you can jump, right? Because you don't have to go in that order. And you, you've all known this, like sometimes you play someone who seems to be really good at predicting you, or they're just really good at delaying their decision by that quarter second so they can see your hand, and they're like, nah, I'm going to change, and I'm going to cheat. You know, you've all played with a sibling, right? Who's bad at this? All right, so it's, it's a reasonably easy game. So what I'd like you to do, just pick a person next to you. Not everybody has to do this. Just pick a person, quickly play a game, and everybody just remember what you chose, all right? So just look at the person next to you, one, two, three, and just remember what you chose, all right? OK. Quick show of hands and everybody, give everybody the chance to look around the room. How many people, uh, the first time you played, if you played more than once to see who won, that's fine. But the first thing you chose, so one, two, three, whatever came out of your hand, who chose rock? OK, so that's good. How many people chose scissors? Oh, interesting. And how many people chose paper? OK, so paper looked about the same as rock. Scissors was way up. That's interesting, right? Because really, if you're just randomly picking your choice, it should be basically equal. Because there's nothing to really make one better than the other. If you choose rock, then you can beat scissors, sure, but paper beats you. And if you choose paper, one beats you. Like, so the probability should be the same in terms of what you choose influencing your probability of winning. It should be irrelevant. But something like 50 to 60% of the class chose scissors. 
which is really interesting. And, and that's kind of what people find in most of these versions, is that actually, in groups of people, they don't choose everything with equal probability. So let's explore this as a really simple sort of toy example that we can do as a chi-squared goodness of fit. The question is, do people choose the same rock, paper, or scissors with equal probability? That's the distribution we're going to talk about. So um, here is some data from another class that ran this exact same example that I yanked out of another, another textbook I have on my shelf. And in their case, something like 55% of the group chose rock. And you're like, amateurs, that's why you choose paper. Paper always beats rock. But then all of you chose scissors. So obviously, you're playing a two-level game. You're deeper than that. And this is how it goes crazy, right? So obviously, we look at what we had. We look at what they had. They don't seem to fit. But let's explore how they don't fit. And that'll be our instructive example to let us do a simulation. And we did do an example like this the other day. Uh, but let's do another one. So if the choices are random, each choice should come up with the same probability of one third from this other class. The only reason I didn't use today's is that I would have to count. And then the slides would have to be updated in real time. And that's just too much hassle. So we're, we're basing this. We're pretending this was us, OK? We had 119 total students. And we expected about 40, 39.7 of those students to pick rock and to pick paper and to pick scissors. Because really, there, there's nothing better about any one of them unless, as I said, you start playing this meta game where you're not trying to just choose one to kind of be random. You're trying to beat what you assume your opponent has chosen to be random. And that's why you all chose scissors. It's because normally people choose rock. So the next step is to choose paper to beat that majority rock. But then you choose scissors to beat that paper. And then the rock comes full cycle and becomes the best choice again. So it, this is our setup. This is our data. And so really, what we're interested in is if we go back up here, this is our data. And then this is 39.7, 39.7, and 39.7. So this is our assumed distribution. This is our expected values. And these are our observed values. Now that we have that, we want to set up a simulation and sample from this. So the pool is the three choices, R's. P's and S's, rocks, papers, and scissors. And from that, we, this would be how we would sample from it. Now, this is just an example. You, you don't need to include this. But it says, I sample from the pool once with replacement. Because if I'm going to do it more than once, I want to have equal probabilities of always getting them. So you've got to keep putting them back in. And then that automatically chooses from the pool with equal probabilities. Now, this is not something we've really talked about. We haven't had too many examples where this came up. But in this example, it's going to sample from the pool. It automatically uses equal probability. But if you want to be explicit, and for any other type of goodness of fit problem where you're trying to set up a simulation to do this, you might not have that equal probability. You can actually specify it as prob. And so what I've done here, this is, this is a, actually exactly the same process because those are equal. If they weren't equal and you changed them, then you would actually get something interesting. And so that would be, I'm taking one third probability of taking rock, one third probability of taking paper, and one third probability of taking scissors. And then I take a look at it, and it's like, well, that person also chose scissors, my randomization. So this is our simulation. So let's tear this apart and take a look at how it works. So the first step is just to set up our expected values. And, and we already know what they are, but the computer doesn't. So we need to specify this. And we say, all right, expected value is 66, 39, and 14 divided by 3. That's 39.6666667. The pool is rock, paper, and scissors. I'm going to do 10,000 iterations. And I'm going to set up a results vector to store those results for each step. Then I have my loop. And so this is the for loop. And this is the boundary of the for loops. Everything between there repeats over and over and over again 10,000 times. And I start by taking a sample from the pool of rock, paper, scissors, the size being that 114 samples. Uh, no, it's 119, sorry. With replacement true and that probability. So that just did what we did. That shows a whole bunch of people worth of rock, paper, and scissors. And now this is not as straightforward as the one that was, say, on your lab exam or that you've seen in some other cases, because we don't have numbers. We can't just sum across them to figure out how many were yeses and how many were noes, because we have three cases. So we break it up. 
And we say the choices are, the first choice is how many true results are there for there being rocks? So you say, take my sample, is it equal to rock? That's a logical. Take the which, which drops all the falses, leaving only those, and then the length tells you how many there were. So that's how many rocks there were in that run. Then how many papers there were in that run, and then how many scissors. That's a three element vector. So this is the number of rocks, the number of papers, and the number of scissors. That's the observed for that one realization of this simulation. And remember, that's our expected. And how do we do a chi-squared? And that's what we're going to save from this. You always save your test statistic out of your simulation. And so we're going to take the sum of O minus E squared over E, the formula for chi-squared. And we save that in the results. Do that 10,000 times over and over and over again. The computer just blip, and it's done. And then we print out the first few. And these are the chi-squared test statistics for our randomization simulation. So most of that should actually make sense to you, given the studying that you've just done for the lab exam and kind of that we're at the end of the term. Maybe you couldn't write it exactly like that, and maybe you wouldn't get all the little bits, but you mostly understand what's going on there, which is good, right? Because now you actually understand that's how a simulation runs. And that should, you should actually, if you have the chance before the final exam, go back over the lectures. There's only 11 of them. It's not that bad. And kind of see how every simulation is basically the same thing. And try and get that clear in your head so that if I ask you questions about randomization techniques, you know the answers. All right, this is what it looks like if I do a histogram of those results. So those are chi-squared test statistics. And I put the limit out to 40 so we could actually see our AB line. Because without that, it wouldn't show up. So this is the end. Let me just label these. This is the start of the histogram call. This is the end of the histogram call. Uh, I'm sorry. That's not correct. That's the end of the histogram call. So this is line one, line two, line three, and line four. I accidentally wrapped the R code in a center. So it centered all of it instead of being. And that's our test statistic. So from this, before you do anything else, what, what does that mean? Is that a normal result, a regular result, something you would expect under the assumption of equal probabilities? No. no that, that, that's a long way out there. That's a long way out there. And from that, we expect, and you, your logic should be here, if there is a p-value that even like isn't zero, it's going to be really tiny. Because almost all of this stuff is actually way outside of that point. And our test statistic had an exact p-value of zero. Because there were zero simulations that were up to the value of 34. Zero out of 10,000. So the p-value is less than 0 0.0001. We can't be sure that you know, if you ran it long enough, you wouldn't eventually get a crazy result like that. But it would take a lot of runs. And the PVL is going to be really, really small. So our conclusion from that is that actually you know, getting 66 rocks out of 119 people, or like you folks did, like 50, 55, 60% scissors, that doesn't really seem to imply that actually the probabilities of selecting them are zero. And what does seem to happen for most groups is that paper is is almost never chosen. Like paper just doesn't seem to be something that people pick. You pick rock because rock smash. And you pick scissor because scissor cut. And you pick paper because paper falls over things. Like, like it just seems, it's the lame choice, right? And so people don't pick it. And so you actually, you know, if you were running an iterated version of this where you pick over and over again, and you wanted to run against a computer that really was choosing at random, what would your strategy be? What should you do to win as often as you can if you're playing against a computer? And literally, the choice from the computer is just going to be a random sample from the pool. And you want to maximize your chances of winning. Yeah. If you're playing against a truly random partner, you stick one. You pick one and you stick with it. And you will win or draw exactly 50% of the time on average. Because... One third of the time, the computer is going to choose the exact same thing you did, two rocks. And so you do it again. One third of the time, the computer is going to choose paper, which is going to beat your rock. And one third of the time, it's going to choose scissors, and you're going to beat that with your rock. 
And that's the best you can actually do, which is why it's a silly game. It's the same as, do you all remember that moment in primary school at some point when you realized tic-tac-toe was a solvable game? Like where every single game could be forced, where you, you could guarantee a win or a draw if you chose first and you knew that. And then you were like, this is a stupid game. And then you played it for another year because you understood it and your friends did it. You could beat them every time. Yeah, these are simple children's games. And actually, they're fully solvable. You can actually write down the full paths of every single possible game. And you can figure out what the optimal strategy is. This is comparing to things like chess and Go, which are so complicated that you can't do that. Yet even there, we've trained computers to kick our asses. So you know, we're at the point where there are very few games left, at least games of, games of thought, games of intellect, where a computer can't beat us. All that remains is video games, actually, for, for a surprising sort of reason. Um, games like, is everybody familiar with sort of um, MOBAs, League of Legends, things like that? You've, a friend's played, or you've played, or whatever. That remains one of the hardest things to try and train a computer to do. There's too many options, too many variations, too many heroes you can play, all these things. There's a group um, being funded by Tesla who's trying to work on this problem. And their big claim to fame so far is that if you restrict it to one hero against one hero on a map where the computer's allowed to see everything, it can beat you most of the time. Which is sort of saying, OK. It's kind of like if you've ever played a video game and you can crank the difficulty up. At some point, it's very clear that the difficult rating is code for cheating. And the computer just cheats against you, and that's how they win. You know, I, when I was a kid, I played games like Red Alert, which are like old school real-time strategy games. And at some level, the computer just started getting free units, just popping out of the ether and was just there. And I was just like, this is not really fun because the computer's very clearly cheating. And I don't like playing against someone who cheats. Anyway, for simple games like this, we can solve them, which means we know optimal strategies. And if you are at all interested in this, this is actually, there's an entire branch of mathematics about this called game theory. And it's about the playing of games and the strategies in games. And you go into some of the philosophy that's attached with it. It's, it's actually really cool stuff. So if you're at all interested, that there is material out there on this kind of thing. What if we did this the easy way? Well, it would be four lines of code to do it in R. Or you could do it by hand if you wanted to, because there's exactly three samples, which is you'd find E, you find O, you do a chi-squared test, and you find the p-value. Notice that we did specify the lower tail being false. We are going up in the chi-squared always. And the p-value was 3.9 times 10 to the minus 8. So we would need to run somewhere in the ballpark of 100 billion simulations to see a result as extreme as this. So our conclusion is that, yes, absolutely, this was not equal probability. Obviously, the introduction of humans to the system broke everything. OK. Um, it is obvious that rock was chosen in the data that we were using here. But remember, the stats don't tell you that. Be very careful not to overgeneralize your statistics, please. Just because it tells you that there's something going on and there is a difference, it doesn't tell you what the difference is. All right, let's now think about the more complicated problem. We can do the same thing, the same kind of setup for a two-way table. But just like a two-way table is more than twice as much work as a goodness of fit, it's more than twice as much work to set up a simulation based on a two-way table. So let's try and think about how we might do this. So I'm going to go back, and I'm just going to use that, uh, that primary school data. You're familiar with it already. You know approximately how it was set up. And so I've set up a matrix, three rows, three columns. I've put the data in. So this is the little table that we had last class. I've labeled the rows so we can keep track of which one is which. We've got a grade four row, a grade five row, and a grade six row. And honestly, I don't remember what the columns were, but it's sort of irrelevant. They were the three things. It was sports, academics, and popularity. Now we have our data. So the question is, how do you draw or simulate from a two by two or a three by three, like a, a table set up instead of a row. Because what we did in the last one was we actually kind of cheated. We didn't sample from the data at all. We sampled from the null distribution, which just gave us the probabilities, and that was how we set everything up. This one's a little bit more complicated. We actually have to sample from this specific setup. So first things first is to figure out the totals down the rows, or sorry, across the rows, down the columns, like we did in class last week. And so this is a function called apply, which we haven't talked about in workshop yet. But what it does is it takes the sum function, and it does it a bunch of times across the rows and columns. And so this goes across the rows and gives us the totals across the rows. So 119, 176, 183. So that's 
119, 176, and 183. And then 247, 141, and 90. So 247, 141, and 90. So we now have the totals down, and we have the totals across, which we need. That was how we set up the chi-squared in the first place, so we're going to need those here. Now, this is where we kind of get to the intuition about how this works. These numbers are fixed. You can't do anything with these. Those numbers are how many students you sampled from. We talked to 119 fourth graders. Their opinions may you know, be something that are, are malleable, but we actually only had 119 10-year-olds. And we had 176 11-year-olds, or whatever age they are. How old are four, grade four, anyway? I've completely lost track of how old people are in primary school. I know they're approximately 12 when they graduate from grade eight. That's, that's about all I remember. So 119, 176, and 183, those people are fixed. We can't do anything with them. But the assumption of a two-way table analysis is that the variables are independent, right? That was our setup for that problem. So if the grade you're in is independent of your opinion about what's most important to you, then that's our angle. That's where we can get our chisel in to pry this apart to actually figure out how to set up this simulation. So we're going to take these people, because they're fixed, and we're going to sample from them in a way that's going to split these up as if it was completely by random chance. And that's what the code is going to do. So the row totals should be distributed randomly across the columns. If they're truly independent, if opinions don't matter, then the grade four should basically just pick one of those three at random. And the grade five should just pick one of those three at random. And the grade sixes should just pick one of those three at random if those are independent. Now, the number of how many people pick sports versus popularity versus academics, that's also fixed in the data. That can't change. That has to be the same number. It's the question of how you jumble them around relative to their rows. And so that's how we're going to set up the sample. So let's go through this. This is actually quite a bit of code. So we're going to have to go slow and sort of make sure we're understanding what's happening. First thing we do is we create a simulation vector which is a bunch of fours to represent the grade fours, a bunch of fives to represent the grade fives, and a bunch of sixes to represent the grade sixes. This is our pool. These are our students. We've got a whole bunch of students in a bag. And we're going to pull a student out and be like, you are popularity. You are academics. You are. But we're going to do the assignment of what they think their favorite thing is or their goal is completely at random. And that's where we introduce the randomness, and that's where we get the jumbling. So we're almost ready. Let's get started. So I've broken this into two slides to break it up. Otherwise, the code's sort of overwhelming at first. So the first thing we do is, like normal, we set up a results vector. We set up a for loop. So we're going to iterate through this, and we're going to examine what's going on. And I sample from the sim vector. Now, the sim vector, remember, this is 4, 4, dot, 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 4, 5, 5, dot, 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 5, 6, 6, dot, 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 6. It's a big old vector with all the grade 4s, all the grade 5s, and all the grade 6s just in there in a row. It doesn't matter what order they're in, really, because we're going to sample at random from it. And so, you know, you could be 5th or 75th, and it doesn't matter. You could be chosen with equal probability. Now, I'm doing this with replace equals false. So essentially, all I'm doing is jumbling the order of the fours, fives, and sixes around. Throw them in a blender, and out comes a completely randomized string of fours, fives, and sixes. Once I've done that, I say, the first 247 of you in that randomized jumble, your goal is grades. And the next 141 of you, your goal was popularity. And then the final 90 of you, your goal was sports. Your priority was sports. 
So the order was completely random. So you could be first or very last, and your assignment to one of those three categories is based purely on your randomized placement in the list. Once we've done this, we now have all of the students across all of the grades. All students, all grades. And each of these is a vector with a random string of fours, fives, and sixes in there. So say four, six, four, four, five, six, five, four, et cetera. So I have 247 fours, fives, and sixes for grades, 141 popular four, fives, and sixes, and 90 four, five, and six sports. Now, I'm not expecting you to have implemented that yourself. I don't expect you to be able to memorize that. But do you understand the methodology I'm using? You understand, like, if you had to do this by hand, you probably could. That's the key, is you kind of understand. And this is the philosophy behind two-way tests of independence, is that you know how many are in each column, and you know how many are in each row. Those have to stay fixed. But within that, you jumble them all up. And then you jumble them all up. And then you jumble them all up. And then you look at how set up these things actually are relative to that. OK, now that we have that, we have to count. Because we need to actually rebuild the table from this randomization. So that's what the next slide does. So I have another for loop. And this is just to try and keep it from being nine lines of code. Because let me go back up a second. If you had this by hand, this is your vector for grades. How would you fill back in the table? I go through that vector. That represents grades. That's the first column. I count how many fours there are. I put that on the top left. I count how many fives there are. I put that in the second left. And then I count how many sixes, and that's the bottom left. Then I go to the second column, and I count the fours, and that's the top. And then I count the fives, and that's the middle. And then I count the sixes, and that's the bottom. And you fill it in, and there's nine different things you'd have to do where you just count how many there are. So that's what this next bit of code actually does, is I loop through three times, one, two, three, and I'm going through by rows. So when j is 1, I do the grade 4s. When j is 2, I do the grade 5s. And when j is 3, I do the grade 6s. So when j is 1, result row 1, column 1 is how many of the grade vector were 4s? How many grade 4s were there in the grade vector? And then j2, or the first row, second column, is how many popular elements were grade 4s? And then how many sport elements were grade 4s? That filled in my top row. Then I do it again for the row 5, the grade 5s. And then I do it again for the grade sixes. And the result here is a matrix of three by three elements. And then I save the hassle of computing O minus E squared over E. And I say, hey, R, do me a chi-squared test, please. And it's like, OK. And out it comes. And so I end up getting the chi-squared result for that matrix by just passing it into that, and I save the results. So that's how you do a permutation test based on a two-way table, is you take the row totals and the column totals, and those have to stay the same. And you jumble the inside based on that material. So you keep the number of grade fours fixed, the number of grade fives fixed, and the number of grade sixes fixed. And then you jumble which column they're in by just shuffling the whole thing around and then saying, first 247, your grades. Next 141, your sports or popularity, sorry. And then last 90, you are popularity. Or, sorry, sports, the other way around. But you just assign them completely at random. You do that a whole bunch of times. And then we can compute a p-value, which is how many of those actually. Now, right. 
So this last little bit here, I'm sorry, I was just, I was just staring at it like, did I write this in a, in a haze last night and I don't remember what it is? This is actually our data test statistic. So on the exam, which you all wrote, that's like p hat. That's actually the chi-squared test statistic for the data matrix, which was the original set of data of the original grade fours, fives, and sixes. And so we're looking for how many of those results are more extreme or as extreme as the original result from the original data. And that's our p-value. And that wraps up the simulation. And that does the results. And so from the simulation, the results that we get, these are what we get. We get chi-squared test statistics, 8.7, 1.7, 6.3, and so on. And the p-value is 0 0.856. So what is the interpretation of a p-value that is large? Fail to reject the null. Because we have a lot of area which that p-value corresponds to, which means we are quite far away from the tail, which means we're right smack dab in the center of the hump, which means we're perfectly average for what we expect. And this is what we found last week, was that actually there is no significant difference that we can see between the grades and their choices. It appears basically be the same across all the grades that it, you know, it's, it's essentially an independent choice. This is what it actually looks like. If I plot the results, I get a histogram. It looks kind of like a chi-squared. You know, like chi-squareds look like this. You know, it's a histogram. Depends how many bins you choose. But there's our histogram. And our result is nowhere near the tail that we would need to reject the null. Not even close. And so we failed to reject that null, which means we conclude that we do not have evidence to conclude that these are not independent. OK, that is the official end of the course for the exam. I am going to talk a little bit more about another topic now. It is not on the final. You may feel free to put down your pens and stop taking notes and just sort of sit back and get something from it, or not. As the case may be, you have phones. You are welcome to play Candy Crush or do whatever you want with the next hour. I would like to talk about essentially the transition to next semester. And to set you all up, there are some people in this class for whom this is the last course. They're not taking 1052. And so it would really sort of, it wouldn't be good for you to go out into the world to have taken a stats course and to have never seen this topic. So I'm going to give you a 20 minute pricey of this topic just so that when you get out there in the world, when you get to this problem, you're like, I vaguely remember this has something to do with the letter T. Okay, I can look this up because I have a textbook. So. Here's our case study that I'm going to use to motivate this guy. Friday the 13th. There's a lot of Friday the 13th, actually. They happen quite often. You know, you get a couple of them a year. Uh, it's just the way our calendar works. And so for a couple of years, researchers in the UK collected data on traffic flow, accidents, and hospital admissions on Friday the 13th and the previous Friday of the same month, Friday the 6th. So they gathered data on the 6th, and then the data on the 13th. And then again, when the 13th rolled around, they did data on the 6th and data on the 13th. And they did this for all of the Friday the 13ths that happened between 1990 and 1992. And as you can see, there was only one Friday the 13th in 1990, but two in 1991, and two in 1992. So this is all the data we have. And they were they're trying to basically show, people have this, this sort of feeling about Friday the 13th, you know, that it's somehow superstitious or, or, you know, if you walk under a ladder, you have bad luck for, it's all just sort of this weird folksy kind of thing that we got from the era when people believed that trees talk to you. And, and somehow it like, it stuck with us. Like, why is Friday the 13th weird? Well, I don't know, why do people believe in horoscopes? You know, like, do people believe crazy shit? That's basically, you know, all of us do. We all have our cognitive biases. But believing Friday the 13th is somehow special is a, is a particularly weird one from the list of things that you can think. So they're from different locations. And this is just an excerpt of what we have. And so location one, location two, location one, location two. We're looking at traffic flow. We're basically trying to see if there's anything going on to try and explain why people keep feeling this superstition. 
And is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? Do people just assume stuff's going to be bad, so then you notice bad? It's like if you're driving your car and you expect to be surrounded by morons, you inevitably are surrounded by morons who do crazy things, like the first day that it snows. I don't know how many of you are actually drivers or like have your own car, but the first day of snow, it's like everybody in the road has completely forgotten how to drive. They're all 16 again and they're just swerving everywhere. And you're just like, oh dear, I'm just going to stay home today because this is dangerous. So if you expect morons, you see morons. If you expect badness to happen, maybe you see badness and that's all it is. So they're trying to explore this data and this is the context of the problem. And what I want to do is sort of inspire you to think about the fact that so far in this course, we've talked about a bunch of distributions. We've talked about a bunch of simulations and a bunch of different things you can do. All of the stuff we've done so far is categorical. We organized them into categories and we counted how many we had. And then we built our models based on that. We have not done anything where we actually just have a bunch of data, numbers, that we then have to analyze. We sort of did a hint to it for the p hat, but in that p hat case, we had two categories that we wanted to talk about. And so those two categories are what inspired us. So the null hypothesis would be that the average traffic flow is equal, and the alternative hypothesis is that they're different. And basically, we're just trying to see if people actually change their habits. Maybe, you know, maybe this is really you're worried about it being Friday the 13th and it being bad luck, so you stay home and traffic flow goes down. Or everybody goes out because reasons. I don't know. So the question is, are the counts from Friday the 6th and the other Friday, Friday the 13th, independent or not? So we want to investigate if people's behavior is different. And comparing these, are the counts independent? No, they are not. Because the counts on the subsequent days are the subsequent week of the same month. And there's really no holidays in there. The 6th and the 13th aren't really special days. You're not near Christmas to get a really weird Christmas holiday rush or anything like that. So the 6th and the 13th, they're in the same month, in the same city. So you expect them to basically be the same. It's a Friday. Traffic flow on a Friday is tra traffic flow on a Friday. People are leaving for the weekend. People are trying to rush home early from work. It, it, Fridays are typically, you know, you don't go anywhere near the 401 in Toronto on a Friday if you can help it. Because it's just a gong show for six hours. And so we know that, we mentally kind of plan for that. All right, so the hypothesis for testing this, this is where it gets interesting. We're testing for a difference, and we are going to look for the difference in the means. So that means this is out. You guys okay up there? Standing up's not that hard. So it's one of these two, and really it could be either of these. The mean difference or the means being the same, those are actually the same statement. So if you take the difference between two means, you compare that to zero versus you say the two means are the same numbers. So we're going to go with this one. This would be how we would set it up. This is actually the plot of the data. So we have the difference in traffic flow in thousands, and we have the frequencies, and it kind of just looks like a bunch of blocks, like there's really nothing going on there. There's no obvious pattern. This is, where, this is what I wanted to get to. This is what I wanted to show you. And you will see this example again probably next semester if you stick with the course and you're coming back. As it, they'll talk about it again and, and you'll do the same thing. But I wanted to at least show you the T. We're told to assume that the cases are independent. It doesn't really seem to be that skewed. But we don't really have very much data. We only have a few points. And this is for a variety of reasons what tends to happen for honors projects in your fourth year is that you have a few data points because it's expensive to gather data and you're lazy and you end up with 14 data points and you're like, all right, statistical analysis, here we come. And then you have 14 data points and you can't do anything with that. So historically, this was exactly the same problem. People had a very small amount of data and wanted to be able to analyze it nonetheless because it wasn't possible to gather more data or it was prohibitively expensive to gather more data. And so they wanted to analyze what they had but the problem was they didn't have enough data for the central limit theorem to kick in. Remember that from chapter two? We talked about, you know, if you, as you have more data, everything starts to behave like a normal. We don't have enough data for this to behave like a normal. And so that's a problem because then what do we use to analyze it? We need a new distribution that's going to behave differently that's going to be applicable to these small data sets. 
So remember, the purposes of large samples, the reason to want at least 30 points was so that the sampling distribution of your center, your mean, would be approximately normal, and your estimate of the standard error, dividing by the square root of n, the usual kind of deal, will be a reliable estimate. That's what we wanted when we wanted 30 points. And so if we don't have that, even if we have not skewed and stuff, it breaks these assumptions. And this leads us to the normality condition, which is that as long as it was nearly normal, so long as all these things are true, the population thing sort of behaves like this. However, why would we necessarily expect that to hold for small sets? Because we don't have a lot of data, so the central limit theorem hasn't kicked in, so we have no guarantees. This leads us to the topic I wanted you to see. I wanted you to at least be aware that this existed, the T distribution, lowercase t. There is an uppercase t distribution as well. It's a capital T squared, but you won't see that in this course. So the only t you'll ever see is this lowercase t. When you are working with small samples and you don't know the true population standard deviation, in that condition there, you use the t distribution, also known in the literature occasionally as the student or student's t. And I'll tell you the story for that in a minute, because it's actually kind of interesting. So it also looks like a bell shape, looks like a normal. But the difference is you take some of the normal shape in the middle, you squish it down a little, and you make the tails fat, make the tails thicker. So that what that means is you're more likely to get big results. Because we've only got a few samples, so you don't really know that that result you see there is actually an outlier. It could just be a big result because you've only got a few and it doesn't sort of converge. And so the observations are more likely to fall further from the mean. Your numbers, you know, the 1.96 that we use all the time for the Z, the Z star values we were using so much a few weeks ago, those don't hold anymore. You have different numbers now. It's more spread out. And this helps resolve the problems. This is what it looks like. So the square, sorry, the solid line here, this one, that's our familiar Z. That's our normal. That shape is what the T looks like for a chosen degree of freedom. So you see, you take some of that area from the center hump, you tamp it down a little, and you squish it all out into the tails. And so the result is that you get fatter tails that could take longer to go down to zero at an expense of the center distribution. Now, the story, this is kind of cool. So how many of you have ever had a Guinness? It's a beer. You know what a Guinness is, yes? Everybody is aware of what Guinness is, yes? You may not drink beer, you may not drink stout, but you know what a Guinness is? OK, so the Guinness Brewery is old, yeah? There used to be a guy who worked at the Guinness Brewery doing quality control for beer. Kind of a cool job. And he was dealing with small sample sets. And he came up with this stuff on his own and submitted it as an anonymous paper to the Royal Society. And he called himself student. I am a student. And he sent in this thing and he described the T distribution. He described how it worked. He derived the derivations for the standard errors and all the other things and showed how you'd use it in a real case that was obviously made up because it wasn't beer. Because if you just said, it's Guinness, they pretty much figure out who he was because his bosses didn't want him sort of associating Guinness with this statistical method. They're like, it's fine to publish it, but you know, it has to be anonymous. And so it became students' T distribution. And it was like that for 60 years before historians kind of, toward the end of his life, he kind of told his story and historians went back and kind of got the whole story and wrote it up and there's, there's a plaque to him at the Guinness Brewery and all these nice things. But that's where it comes from, is this guy back in 1906 working at Guinness doing quality control on big old casks of beer who wanted to be able to do statistical derivations for the quality of that beer. And the reason that he didn't want to you know, just get 30 samples is that for every sample he had, he had to crack a cask. And that's money down the drain because once it's opened, it's opened. And you know, you'd be taking it out and you'd do a sample of the yeasts and all the rest of it, but every one you open is one they can't sell. And this is, you know, if you ever end up in industry doing quality control, which is something that you may end up doing, it's the path to get to quality control is weird. Your boss is not going to be happy if your plan for this is, well, 
I need 100 samples, so I need 100 of these DVD players so I can do destructive testing on them. Your boss is like, well, that's you know, $8,000. Yeah? Doesn't happen so much. So when you have to destroy the product to do the testing, they tend to use smaller samples because it's really, really expensive. And there are some products where you can't do that for them. So that's the origin story of where the tea came from. So tea distribution, students' tea distribution, you'll always remember that it came from the Guinness Brewery and from a guy who worked there. So it's always centered at zero, and it is like chi-squared. doesn't have a mean. It doesn't have a standard deviation. It just has a degree of freedom. No. No, absolutely not. So his question was, you, know, you notice how the shapes were a little bit different, like they spread out? How far out you have to go to get your first and second standard deviation or third to do your T stars like you do a Z star is different, very much different. And it depends on the degree of freedom. So it has one parameter only, which is degree of freedom, like chi-squared. So we had some questions in Slack about this, and hopefully it did click last week or two weeks ago when I was talking about this. With the chi-squared, the higher you crank the degrees of freedom, the more like a normal it looks like. Remember that plot? As I, as I moved it out, it looked more and more like a hump shape. But it also gets really, really big. Because it never loses the fact that it starts at zero. So you keep moving it out, and it's making this normal, but it's all the way out like this. And the standard deviation is enormous. In the same way, the T distribution starts with low degrees of freedom, looking like a normal, but with significantly higher standard deviation. Now, the interesting part about that is that the convergence happens in reverse. As you increase the degrees of freedom for a t, it gets closer and closer to a normal, just like chi-squared, but it gets closer and closer to the standard normal. Once you have 30 degrees of freedom, they agree to three decimals. So what happens to the shape as it increases? This was exactly what I was about to talk about. There's a whole bunch of them. They are, the convergence is this way with degrees of freedom. So you start with the shape that's out here, and at the bottom, and as degrees of freedom goes up, it gets closer and closer and closer to the normal, but it gets closer and closer to the standard Z normal, not just an arbitrary normal, which is what happens with the chi-squared. Which is why, once you have 30 degrees of freedom for a T, you throw up in your hands and you go, all right, I'm done. Back to the Z we go. Because they're basically the same. Because you now have 30 samples and the central limit theorem is starting to kick in, and you can assume it's normal again. So it's only for a very specific set of data where you have smaller than 30 samples and you need to protect yourself from these extreme values. So if you wanted two degrees of agreement between the curves, you need 14 degrees of freedom. If you want three degrees of freedom, uh, sorry, three decimals of agreement out to the far tails, you need 136 points. And then if you want four decimals, you need 1,300 points. Have you said this? At 30 degrees of freedom, I'm just going to erase that. It's right there. At 30 degrees of freedom, you get three decimals inside minus 3,3. Three. And you sort of remember what we've seen in class so far. Anytime you see a big Z, like a Z of 4, 5, 6, 8, you're like, yeah, all right. <laughs> I'm rejecting the null. Hopefully, you've seen enough examples. We've done like several dozen examples where you're starting to see, OK, that means big. You have a sense of scale for your Z. A Z that's one is small, a Z that's three is big. And so in the same way, if you're kind of just like all you want is agreement inside the center block to be able to tell that difference, because once you're out in the tail, like a difference between eight and nine is irrelevant, then all you need is 30 degrees of freedom. So as soon as we have 30, we just switch it over. And we say, all right, Z, go back to the Z. All right, let's just wrap up this problem. And, uh, and then we are done. So this is the data again. We have from the data that the mean difference in traffic flows between the 6th and the 13th is 1,800. The standard deviation is 1,176, and we had 10 samples. So we didn't have a lot of data. It's, you know, you have to go back a lot of years to gather that because there's only so many Friday the 13ths. And as every example we've done so far in this class, our estimate of our test statistic is always Point estimate minus null estimate or null value divided by the standard error. And so we just write all those things down. Just like the chi-squared, it's one less degree of freedom. And we put it all together, 
and the, the null difference being zero leads to a p-value of 0 0.0008. Now, remember when I introduced chi-squared and I got you to kind of think for a minute and say, well, what in R would you use to do the p's and the q's for a chi-squared? And you were like, uh, maybe p chi squared? And I was like, yeah, exactly. It's p, you know, it's p norm, q norm, p chi squared, q chi squared, pt, qt, pf, qf, which you'll see next semester, and so on. They all behave the same. You just change which distribution it is. All the same logic, all the same syntax. It's designed to be very seamless. So pt is like p norm but for the t distribution. And so you specify the degrees of freedom, you put in your test statistic, you double it because we were doing a different two-tailed test, and our p-value is very, very small. So the data do provide convincing evidence of a difference between traffic flows on Friday the 6th and Friday the 13th. That would be a display of where those p-values show up. So we're zooming way in here to see what is left of the tails. You can't even really see the difference on this graph. So we are way outside the center hump. We reject the null. Now, it would be more interesting to find out exactly what this difference is, maybe. And so in exactly the same way as we did when we were doing the normal tests at the start of chapter 3, we can also do confidence intervals in exactly the same way using the t, all the same logic. So it's a point estimate, plus or minus a margin of error. And the margin of error is a t star, which is like a z star. And you look it up, so 1.96 for my Z star, but we use a different number because, as he asked, it spreads more. So 9 degrees of freedom. I can use QT just like I would use Q norm to figure out what I need. And so I take a 0 0.025 and a 0.975, just the same logic, but QT instead of PT, uh, QT instead of Q norm, specify the degrees of freedom. So these actually compare to the Zs, and they are bigger. You remember your, your numbers for Z? 1.645, 1.96, and what was the next one up? 2.58. Those were the three numbers. This is the 1.96 one. This is the center of those three. This is the 95% so this is 1.96. So you can see it inflates it all the way up to 2.26 instead of 1.96. And if you did 2.58, it's more like 3. And if you did 1.645, it's like 1.85, somewhere in there. Put all that together. Um, which one of these is correct? It's that one. And so the 95% confidence interval then for the difference between the flow and the 6th and the 13th is 995 and 2677. Remember the logic for rejecting of null? If your confidence interval doesn't overlap your null hypothesis, you reject. This doesn't overlap zero, so we reject. So the reason that I did this, and it's not on the exam, and, and I don't want you to memorize it, you don't have to worry about it, don't stress about it, it's just to sort of show you that we, on this semester we've been taking this arc and we started by kind of trying to teach you about the language of statistics. And then we taught you about the underlying structure of statistics with the central limit theorem. And now we've been doing things that actually, if you look back at them, are all kind of variations on a theme. We did p hat tests for single proportion. We did p hat 1, p hat 2 tests for two proportions. We did a chi-squared test for goodness of fit. We did a chi-squared test for our two-way contingency tables. The arc continues next semester by going from categorical data, which was chapter three, to continuous numerical data, which is chapter four. And the majority of chapter four is spent doing the t distribution over and over again until you get 30 samples, at which point you take a step back and you say, all right, back to the z we go. And then you use the z distribution, which you used already from chapter three. And that kind of brings you to the end of this arc of classical statistics. And then the next step beyond that is to do regression, and that'll take the rest of the course. So that is the end of the material for the group. Just give me a sec. I'm just wrapping up. You don't need to rush out. I mean, you can if you want to. It's fine. Um, all the assignments are done. All the quizzes are done. I'll have your grades up for everything next week.
Your grades for your exam are already posted, so you can go check them out. And the review assignment is up. I'm going to add the last questions today. I was waiting for that quiz to kind of wrap up and for all that. So I'm going to add the last few questions from the last topic to that. That review assignment has an infinite number of attempts. The exam will be taken from the material on that assignment, those 120 odd questions. So you know how to study. If you have questions about your lab exam, you may come talk to me. I have office hours today and tomorrow. And if not, we'll do some more discussion about the exam next week. But otherwise, have a wonderful week.